Hey there, it's PK Beats with more Smash Wiki stuff. Basically just me reading through the wiki pages of Smash things, primarily the trivia section at the bottom of each page, and showing y'all things I found interesting. On a quick note, last video I organized things to go over the whole first row of the cast, but I think going forward I'm just gonna tackle whatever I can get a normal video length out of. So rather than doing the whole second row of fighters this video, I'm just gonna handle them through to Zelda this time. So let's start off with Peach. The beginning piece of trivia is, yes, another inconsistency with the character model. First, if you look into her dress, please stay with me on this one, see this part of it? It's lower than the white arc pattern part of the dress, right? But looking into the dress, that part is higher. If we pan the camera while paying attention to this, we can see the cloth just disappear. It's like an optical illusion almost, trying to make the dress seem longer in the front, but shorter from the inside. It's kind of weird how this happens. You can see this with other alt colors too. And the other model inconsistency is a gap that you can see in Peach's neck. It's pretty subtle, but here it is right there. I promise there are no other model gap submissions in this video. Actually, that's a lie, but let's move on. Peach has the most idle animations out of any character in the cast, with four. She has one where she briefly checks her nails, one where she briefly brushes her hair, one where she stretches her arms, and one where she looks around before brushing off her dress a bit. I guess royalty like this takes some high maintenance. Normally characters have two idle animations that they can go through, so Peach is ahead by quite a bit. And the only other exceptions to this animation count are Jigglypuff and Byleth, who each only have one animation. And Steve, who has none. Which I think is just fantastic. And lastly for Peach, in her voice test library, the sound of her victory line is actually split up into two options. Oh, did I win? Not only are they split up, but they're actually pretty far apart from each other, considering they're one after the other. And I don't recall the aw part of the voice clip being used in isolation anywhere else, so I don't know. This wasn't the case in any of the past games, and it's far from the only time voice lines are weirdly separated like this in this game. I still don't fully understand why this sometimes happens, but it's weird and unnatural. Alright, let's move on to Daisy. To start, the model inconsistencies mentioned about Peach are the same for Daisy. The gap in her neck is here and whatnot. However, the thing about the dress lace is a bit different. We can see that the dress length is all well and good here. What's off is this part, the arc pattern. If you view the dress from inside, again please do not get the wrong idea with this camera angle, then you will see the texture just disappear, even though it should wrap around. And again, this happens with any of the alts. I'm sure anyone more knowledgeable about character modeling would have a good explanation in the comments, so I'll just leave that there. Next, if Daisy uses her back throw when Peach is in a match, regardless of whether or not it's being used against Peach, some heart effects will show up for the move. Normally the animation looks like this, no hearts of any kind, so they only appear if Peach is present in the match in some capacity. This strangely niche setup already makes this reek of unintentional, but it's especially so when you realize that even Peach doesn't have this happen to her. Under no circumstances will her back throw have heart effects, even if there's another Peach in the match. So that's weird. I was curious about testing this in Squad Strike 2. We've learned on the channel before that once a character gets KO'd and swapped out in this game mode, their character is sort of unloaded. So I was curious if that would carry over here. So we have normal Daisy back throw, no effects. Then Peach spawns in, there's hearts. Then she gets KO'd, and again, there are no hearts. This is compared to a normal match, where even if Peach loses her last stock, she's still technically loaded, meaning Daisy's back throw still produces hearts. And lastly for Daisy, it's mentioned how in her white dress alt, her crown is displayed as gold, as it usually is, but in the actual match, it's colored silver. Now, I know I'm not entirely a scientist, but in my limited research, I have learned that gold is not silver. This isn't even the first time this has happened. For Luigi's yellow outfit, the render shows the L on his cap as also being yellow, similar to his clothes, and the same as the previous alt. But the stock icon shows it as being light blue, as does the actual in-game model. Which is really silly, especially considering how long this has been the case. You know, I probably could have included that in my last video, but I guess at the time, I thought it was already too well documented on other channels for me to even bother. But since I touched up on the daisy thing, I guess I'll just toss it in here, why not? I'm sure someone will learn it for the first time here. 
Another thing you'll learn for the first time here is today's video sponsor, Random Dice Defense. Random Dice Defense is a strategy game where you can create a custom battle deck of five different dice, each with unique abilities, making millions of combinations to match different styles. The goal is to maintain enough damage output to defeat these enemies before they reach your health, which you can do by spawning and powering up your dice. When you merge the same tower of dice with the same number of dots, you'll get a dice tower that is one level higher, but its tower type will change randomly. Strategy is key in this game, so summon, merge, or power up. And make sure to use SP strategically. You get it after you defeat enemies, and it's necessary for summoning new dice or powering them up. Summoning a greater number of weaker dice can be better than having a small number of strong dice. On top of this, Random Dice has a built-in system that allows you to play with your friends, using friendly battle codes. Either you can make the lobby and share your code with a friend, or have a friend send you their code and you join them. So click on the link in the description and download Random Dice Defense to roll the dice and build your deck today. And thank you Random Dice for sponsoring today's video. Let's move on and tackle Bowser. He's got a prompt about how, when he's on a ladder, if he uses his down air, he'll float in the air like this. Which actually makes for a pretty safe and effective aerial, since normally the downside is that you're sent plummeting to the ground. And because of this effect, it means you can technically down air upwards, which is wacky. This is worth bringing up because, in terms of plummet down airs, of which there are several, Bowser's is the only one that doesn't fall down when on a ladder, which is very odd. Also in doing this, I saw what Bayonetta's ladder animation was. I had no idea she made this pose. I guess it's not often that I see a Bayonetta on a ladder. It's real flashy, though the transition from this to her climb is a single frame, which is a little bit jarring, but you know. Anyways, moving on from that, let's hop into Ice Climbers, who have quite a lot to work with. We'll start with the model gaps. There's apparently quite a few. When hanging from the ledge, you can see that the fur on the bottom of their coat has a big gap in it right here. Also, in Popo's face, you can see a very slight gap between his hair and his coat right here. And for Nana, there's a pretty noticeable gap between her bangs and her forehead right here. So yeah, these folk are full of holes. Next, as mentioned how the partner Ice Climber's AI level is actually 77, which is data that was obtained by Meshima on Twitter, just to give some credit there. If you're wondering, a level 8 CPU has an AI level of 75, so the partner Ice Climber is a little bit smarter than that. A good way to see that AI take over is by riding something, like the Dragoon. Look at the slightly better than a level 8 CPU go. This arbitrary 77 number is likely a reference to Nana's name. I guess it'd be pronounced Nana. In terms of number puns, Nana could be interpreted as 77, as Na would be 7, so Nana is 7-7. Seven, seven. Of course, Nana is also just how you say 7 on its own as well. You could also say Shichi. Okay, basically, numbers in Japanese are really diverse in ways that you can pronounce them, which makes for some very diverse number puns. So it's very likely that this 77 number is just a pun for Nana's name. Nana? Nana? I don't know which one I should say anymore. Eh, I'll stick with Nana. Of course, this logic goes out the window when Popo is the partner Ice Climber instead of Nana, but I guess the spirit is still there. Also, in basically my entire career, I've always referred to them as the primary ice climber and the secondary ice climber, since that's just what I thought of, I guess. But the terminology used by the wiki, that being leader ice climber and the partner ice climber, is a little bit better. Anyhow, next, when you play on a custom stage, the entrance animation for the ice climbers will have a little glitch, specifically the condor that carries them in. It doesn't disappear until the go appears on the screen. For a better comparison, here's an 8-player match version, where the camera zoomed out. We see that all of them just sort of stick in place awkwardly until the go appears, when they instantly disappear. This is compared to normal, where they each just disappear in their own time. Also, I don't know if the capture card shows it, but my game was dropping a lot of frames in this environment, which I thought was funny. Next, as mentioned how when both Ice Climbers swing the home run bat, you'll be able to hear Nana vocalize before Popo. We can prove that this is Nana's voice clip that's out of place if we just Yoshi her and try again. And here is just Popo's line. It's in time with the actual swing of the bat rather than the startup. So Nana's mistiming is likely a carryover from past games, where characters would normally vocalize on the startup, not the swing. Even though it was changed to where everyone else makes their little noise at the swing. The only other exception, as far as I know, is Falco who shares his property with Nana and vocalizes during the startup. Also, I need to clarify that yes, I am specifying Nana for a reason. 
It's not like this is the case with the partner Ice Climber, but specifically Nana. If you go to the alt that swaps them and pull Yoshi on Popo, Nana here still has the improperly timed voice line. Which I find really interesting. I guess even when the roles are swapped, Nana is still considered a unique entity from Popo. It almost makes me wonder if Popo's AI level is different from Nana's, though I don't think so. Next, the Ice Climbers are the only characters in the game who wield weapons at all times to be affected by stance mirroring. That means what it sounds like. When they turn around, their hammers get placed on the other hand, as opposed to other characters like Link, whose sword wielding hand is consistent. This is either to suggest that the Ice Climbers are ambidextrous, or perhaps to keep the hammers behind the Ice Climbers and not get in the way, since they are pretty big. Normally I'd also bring up the possibility that it's just an oversight, since those are pretty frequent in this game. But considering the animation goes out of its way to show them passing the hammer into the other hand when they turn around, it feels more like an artistic choice. Again, likely to keep the hammers in the back and keep their faces nice and visible. And lastly for the Ice Climbers, apparently the odds for what sort of KO animation they'll do when KO'd from the top blast zone isn't fully random. That is, whatever animation one of the Ice Climbers will do, it's much more likely that the other Ice Climber will also do that animation. With just standard KOs we can easily see this, they're almost always doing the same thing. It's not guaranteed, in some cases they did do different things, like right here where Nana just gets KO'd but Popo gets star KO'd. But even without raw numbers or whatever, it's pretty easy to tell. And the thing is, this seemed to be the case even with the help from these two items. For those of you unaware, the boss Galaga guarantees a star KO, and the beetle guarantees a screen KO. So if you get one Ice Climber KO'd in this guaranteed fashion, and just normally KO the remaining one, it'll be more likely that they'll also have whatever specialized KO animation the other received, and so on. Again, it's not guaranteed, but it definitely feels more likely. What made this even more definite for me, though, is when you mix and match these items. When one of the Ice Climbers was being KO'd by the boss Galaga, and then another gets KO'd by the beetle shortly afterwards, they still get star KO'd, even though the beetle normally guarantees a screen KO. And with the reverse timing, the opposite happens, where the boss Galaga ends up giving you a screen KO instead. Which is really crazy to me, and really drives home the idea that their animations are tied to whichever Ice Climber got KO'd first. This isn't a permanent tie or anything, it's based on that quick timing. So if an Ice Climber gets a certain KO animation, and you wait a bit to KO the other one, there seem to be zero connection. Also, if you end up testing this yourself, be prepared to deal with the wrath of the uh, slightly higher than level 8 CPU Ice Climber, which actually kind of kicked my butt a few times. Okay, let's finally move on from the Ice Climbers with Sheik. This isn't really a gameplay thing, but a prompt mentions... Okay, wait, hold on. Major spoilers for the plot of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Anyways, a prompt mentions how Nintendo themselves are actually pretty inconsistent with Sheik's gender. As basically everyone knows, Sheik is Zelda, well, in disguise. But there's debate on what gender that makes Sheik. Zelda's a girl. So people say because Sheik is Zelda, that makes Sheik a girl. Modus ponens, or whatever format that would be. But there's also the argument made that because this is some Sheik a magic disguise thing, Zelda could have also changed her gender in this form, making Sheik a boy. But I'm not really here to make any stances on that. I'm just here to point out the inconsistency in how Nintendo treats it. Like here on the official Smash Ultimate blog, they use male pronouns for Sheik, and they also use male pronouns for Sheik in Palutena's Guidance. Although this is more played up as a joke as Pitt later comments that Sheik is just Zelda, but I mean if the goddesses are using male pronouns then they might know more than us. But then Sheik's trophy description in past games uses female pronouns, and the in-game tips here use female pronouns everywhere, and generally female pronouns seem to be the go-to in most places. I guess it's just that type of thing where whatever intern is writing whatever post regarding Sheik, they're free to use whatever headcanon they got, I guess. It's an interesting topic at least, which is why I thought it would be funny to point out. Next, as mentioned how when Sheik holds an item, her stance will revert back to the one from Brawl, and we can very clearly see the difference here. You know, this isn't the only character where this happens either, and in the last episode we even mentioned how Luigi will revert to his Smash 4 shielding animation once his shield gets hit. So I guess whenever that comes up again I'll mention it, but it's still weird. Also, when skimming the Sheik wiki, I realized that all of the moves were named, and not only named, but show their Japanese names too, which I found really interesting. See, in the far past video I made, I went over all the named moves, but those were only from the in-game tips. In that, I'd mentioned how I was aware that all characters from Melee and whatnot had their moves named in some booklet or whatever, but when I saw this, I got curious and looked at other non-Melee characters, and they also all had names for their moves. 
The only ones that didn't end up having everything named were some of the DLC characters. Though some, like Steve, did. And the Smash Ultimate newcomers all did as well. Obviously I didn't check every single character, so you can see for yourself whichever one you're interested in, but yeah. I don't think I'll make another video on that, especially given the now much larger scope, but that's something interesting if you're ever curious. I don't know where they got these names from, but the Japanese variant that accompanies does make me think they're more official, so that's cool. And lastly for today's video, a prompt in Zelda's wiki mentions how, when she does her hair sway idle animation, the gravity that normally affects her hair is temporarily disabled. You can see how normally on this stage, Zelda's hair sways quite a bit in the wind, and how this stops for a moment during the idle animation. It makes full sense, and it's not a huge prompt, but I think this type of thing is interesting to point out, especially because I feel like there's a lot of people who probably don't even know about the whole mechanic where cloth and hair and whatnot sway in the wind, and each stage has different amounts of wind and at different times and whatnot. It's pretty cool. And I think I'll end the video there. I hope y'all like the things gone over today, and I also hope y'all are enjoying this new series. In my last video I mentioned how I'm thinking about making this series the new focus on the channel, given the ease of development and sheer quantity of things to work with, so I hope y'all look forward to that. And I'd like to thank my patrons Scully, Burbo, Rain, Civilon700, and everyone else for their support. Stay casual, and I'll see y'all later.